Hello everybody, this is Pastor Tom welcoming you to another study in the Word. How are you doing today? We're here in beautiful Wisconsin, the woods. If you can look behind me out my window there, you see the trees blowing. It is the first little bit of winter that we've had this year. Actually, I think it might even leave a little bit of snow in some areas south of us here in the next few days. The temperature is not hideously cold or anything. It's still pretty warm for this time of year, but it seems like it's starting to change. Anyway, we're doing uh, our teaching and our next uh, in a series of teachings we're doing about the Apostles' Ministry. This will be the fourth teaching. This will be a real fun teaching and interesting teaching. And I'm going to talk today about the Apostle being an incredible, incredible person of signs, wonders, and miracles, and divers' gifts of the Holy Ghost. Um, we were talking about the qualifications for the Apostles, great character, and... Uh, but one of the signs of the apostle is signs and wonders. And, and in the Bible, in the New Testament, there is no ministry gift that is mentioned near as much as the apostles' ministry when it comes to uh, signs, wonders, miracles, and stuff. Now, let's just face it, that's true, isn't it? So we need to realize that the true apostles really will have a long string of miraculous events that will take place in their life and their ministry and they can reference them. And I want to make sure that you understand something. They should reference them. Uh, one of the people that I respect the most over the years uh, that taught me uh, and, and, and people that I listened to was Brother Kenneth E. Hagen. And I know some of you, when you hear that name, you know, you, you've heard bad things and freak out. But that, that just comes with the territory. Anybody who is a pioneer and, and uh, anybody who... Uh, does anything where God's going to get a lot of flack from people that don't understand or know or really listen to them. But I listened to Brother Hagen many times very carefully. There was something that I learned from him. I also learned this from Norval Hayes. I learned this from Jerry Savelle. I learned this from people around me that I listened to a lot when I was in the foundational life uh, of my Christian life and actually still listen to today, to be honest with you. And I noticed something about... Brother Hagen and these other guys I was talking about, is they could give you testimonies. They would take us, it's a area of scripture that they were going to teach on, and they would share that scripture and they would teach on it, but they would include tremendous things that had happened in their per per personal life and ministry that related to what they were teaching. And that really enhances the teaching because we overcome Satan by the word of God and, the, and our testimony, see in the word of our testimony. And so we need to understand that true apostles are going to have a tremendous testimony, not only uh, sometimes when they're, they're saved. With me, the Apostle Paul had a tremendous uh, experience, uh, a Damascus Road experience. You'll find that most apostles and prophets, even fivefold ministry gift, will have some kind of an experience. It's not always the case. But with me it was, I had a miraculous vision that called me to ministry and some of you have heard that. <clears throat> I won't get into that today because that's not the point of my my message. But then uh, also, not only is there is is something miraculous really strong happens in their conversion experience, but many times, um, all the way through the true apostles' ministry, somebody that really is called that office, there'll be a string of the miraculous events of miracles, signs, wonders, healings, deliverances, and so on, all the way through their ministry. And if they don't have that, and they can't reference that, and they they can't teach about that and put it into their sermons and stuff, I wouldn't. Uh, I'd be I'd be weary of that. Second Corinthians chapter twelve. Ooh, I'm on the Second Corinthians chapter two. Go to Second Corinthians chapter. Did I say twelve? I don't know if that's right or not. We'll have to see. Uh, yes. Let's see here. Let's look down here and see if this is what I want. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, is that what I want, or do I want 2 Corinthians chapter 2? No, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, says this, Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. This is an interesting scripture. He very, very clearly points out 
because really what he's doing in this chapter, and we'll talk about this later, is he's refuting false apostles, that uh, there's many false apostles. Now, let me say something about false apostles. You know, you have people like the Reverend Jim Jones, you have people like Reverend Sun Young Moon, you have people like uh, the Church of Almighty God that are out there today, and Brother Philippi, or whatever his name is, that appears all over the place, and, and different false apostles and, and prophets and, and teachers. And we tend to think of false apostles, prophets, teachers, of those type of folks, cults and so on, and that certainly would be the case. But let me tell you something that's a danger in just understanding that and not understanding that a false apostle could be a Christian who really loves God and who really, for some reason, has unfortunately thought themselves to be something they're not, which happens a lot, and they come over and they get a card or somebody prophesies over them or whatever the case may be, but they're not really called to that ministry, but they call themselves that and they try to operate in that ministry. Now, when we're trying to operate in a ministry and an anointing area that we're not called to, that God doesn't give you, that is not real, that, that is, doesn't have that real function, then to a certain extent... We are a false whatever. You can be a false prophet that way. You can be a Christian. You can love God. You can be a pastor. But maybe you think you're a prophet too and you're not. These are areas that we need to discuss. We need to be open about them. This is not the worst kind of false apostle. I remember Brother Hagin uh, pastored a church for 12 years. And uh, he was never really called a pastor. But God blessed his churches. God blessed his ministry, his teaching ministry that way. And he learned from that. So I'm not saying that we ought to just throw everybody out of ministry who makes a mistake like this or whatever. But what I am saying is dangerous. You can't continue to do that over the course of your ministry. Something will happen and it will be devastating to you. So we don't need people calling themselves something. We need the to know what the signs are, what uh, will be in that person's life to watch for. And we judge those things by the fruit, not the person. People make mistakes. Okay, all right, I said enough. But here Paul says, truly, okay, because there's a lot of untruth, and there's a lot of untruth amongst the apostolic move of God today, and there will be. Until the thing is totally established, you're always going to have people that misunderstand, misteach. Uh, they take a certain principle in the apostle's office, and they, they take it to an extreme. We're going to have that. We're going to have people who do that. We're going to have people who say, any church needs an apostle over it, and, and I want to be the apostle over your church, and all this, you need me in church government. Uh, that is a, something that we got to really watch, because, let me tell you why. Because, as an example, Brother Hagin, when Jesus appeared to him and told him, talked to him about the apostles coming, apostles' ministry being reestablished kind of in the church and the prophets' ministry, he warned them that people would do this stuff. And I've seen it. I've seen people that really probably weren't even called to the apostles' ministry run around and try to oversee churches and stuff that they were never uh, affiliated with or really even didn't give birth to or didn't have a relationship with the pastor in that church that that uh, they trusted, the pastor trusted them and knew them and and uh, you know wanted that relationship. And so this is really, we have, to be, we have to be concerned about these things. I don't want to overemphasize it. But one of the areas that you can tell a true apostle, and, 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 and we need to, is in mighty signs and wonders. Now the word here, signs, is an interesting word. Because in the Greek it means a miracle with an ethical purpose, an ethical end to it. In other words, it points, a sign points to something. This will point to Jesus. This will point to his word. This will exalt Jesus, not man. Amen. And so this indicates the grace and power of Jesus Christ, God working through us, working through the apostle, and always should point to Jesus, not to the individual, um, not to the person. We have a lot of that. We have a lot of people who operate in, in an area of signs and wonders, and unfortunately they don't really point to Jesus, they kind of point to themselves. And we've got to be very weary of people like that, because there, there's, constantly, there's a constant urge and temptation to try to draw attention to oneself, let the sign do it for you, you know. And then uh, the, the word wonders here is an interesting word because it, it means startling and amazing and dynamic miracles that we know only God could do. And that has to be operating. You have to have 
as an apostle, you will have startling, amazing, dynamic miracles only God could do. All right? And then, uh, I don't, I'm not talking about every time you go out and preach or something, but I'm talking about on a consistent, consistent basis. Amen. And then the word mighty deeds here is one. It means, it, it really comes from the Greek word dynamite or dunamis. That uh, dynamite, dunamis power that will be operating in the apostles' ministry to bring about these mighty signs, wonders, deeds, just an ability, then the giftedness and the grace that is above the average in this area for sure. Then go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want to I want to mention this to you if you if you will please. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to talk about these signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit and all this stuff that need to be in the apostles' ministry. And they need to be there because apostles, by nature, again, are pioneers. They go into areas they go, that haven't had churches or churches like, the, um, like we're talking about. And so they're always pioneering something, and there's a great impact. And one of the impacts they have is that some of these wonderful signs and wonders and miracles will take place. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to, uh, to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear or reverence and uh, in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and power. Now why? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our faith needs to be in the power of God. Now, your faith can't be much in the power of God if you never see the power of God manifested. And this is why we need signs and wonders. And People ask me that. Well, we're not supposed to follow signs. No, signs are supposed to follow us. But we need, there are signs. They point to Jesus. We need to see them. We need to see demonstrations of God's power. We need to see them over and over and over again, and we need to hear about them, and we need the testimonies, because it encourages people that God is real, working amongst his people, and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. Now, um, supernatural ability and anointing here. Paul talks about this. He, he Even his preaching and his teaching and his ministry had a certain stronger element to it than maybe somebody else would because of the uh, the territorial impact that they needed to have in ministry. It's interesting. You know, there's been certain people over the years that I have observed. And uh, I have to tell you that, you know, immediately I was caught, I was taken up, I was, I was caught by the tremendous punch or impact or anointing upon these individuals. And uh, I've seen many of them. I could mention them to you. I'm not going to mention them to you today. But many of them that just caught my attention because they were anointed above their fellows. In other words, it was clear that there was something working there that was not working just in everybody's ministry the same way or the same level. And this is true in the apostles' ministry. Now, in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through, through, uh, 1 through 2, Jesus sent out 70 and he gave them power to, you know, heal the sick and cleanse the lepers or raise the dead and cast out devils. And uh, he did it with the 12 in Luke chapter, or excuse me, with the 12 first and then the 70 in Luke chapter 10. Excuse me, I'm turning those around. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and then 17 through 20. And the Bible talks about how they went out, they healed the sick, they cleansed the lepers, they raised the dead. They came back, the 70, and said, Lord, you know, even the devils. Even demons are subject to us through thy name. I found out. And God had put that anointing on them. Jesus had put that anointing on them. And he was showing them what kind of anointing they could walk in as apostles. And to a certain extent, even the body of Christ, we can walk in that anointing that has tremendous power to change people's lives, to bring healing and deliverance to people. Now, in, in Acts chapter 2, we're going to read uh, some certain scriptures. I just want to kind of go through this and just read you some scriptures because the scriptures are vitally important. In Acts chapter 2, verse 43, we see this. Notice this. And fear came upon every soul, and many, many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Isn't that interesting? Many, many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things in common, 
And they sold their possessions and good and parted them to all that had men that had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So here we see the early church in action. And we saw many signs and wonders being done by the apostles. God put a stamp of approval on them. The people saw that. So they were on board. Okay, and one of the things pastors ask me is, how can we get people on board? Well, you need to have the miraculous. You need to have power in your preaching, power in your teaching, power in your leadership ability. All right, so people will follow you. You also have to have a vision. You got to have a vision that you cast so people know where you're going and people know what you're called to do. And people will get behind that vision. And thirdly, and probably most importantly, they've got to see results. They've got to see people being saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and healed and delivered. They've got to see results. So we need signs, wonders, miracles, and we need the anointing, and we need these things because people can see the results of something. You know, one of the things that happened to, to us here recently was the kids in, in Pakistan taking our videos. I'm sitting at the desk just like this. They took a video. They overdubbed it in their language. They take it into villages where most people have never even heard the gospel. They put it up on a projector from their computer. Of course, they overdubbed my words, and I go through salvation, healing, deliverance, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, all in one video. And miraculous things take place. Cripples walk off. Demons come out of people. People are healed. People are filled with the Holy Ghost in every service. Up to, and 70%, 60 I think it's 70%, really, closer to 70% of every uh, meeting they have of the people come to the Lord Jesus Christ earnestly. These are Muslims. These are people involved in black magic. That is apostolic. Now, you could have somebody take a <clears throat> video and do the same thing and get very little results. And the reason for it is because of the anointing. The, uh, we're called to do that, in, and we're called to Pakistan to do that. And so God puts his punch and anointing on that. Anybody can get some results when they preach the word, but there's a special anointing on me to minister to those people. And therefore, when I do, that's what happens. That's a sign. Those are wonders. Those are miracles. That's the stamp of God's approval on that particular work and that apostolic work. Then in Acts chapter 3, if you look at Acts chapter 3, verse 1, very interesting. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, having the uh, uh, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily in the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them. And they entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked in alms. And Peter fastened his eyes upon with John and said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I have none, but such as I give thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand, lifted him up, immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength, and he was leaping up, stood, walked, and entered with them in the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now that was a sight. And talking about apostolic, here's, here is Peter and John walking into a temple, now, in those days, this person, everybody knew this person, and the reason they did was because in those days, excuse me, uh, the cripples, or people that could not take care of themselves, blind people and so on, had a coat that the government would give them to put on that legalized them for, uh, to receive uh, benefit from people knowing that they had disabilities and the people took care of them instead of the government. Sounds pretty good to me. And um, But the, the thing was that everybody knew this man. This man had been there 40 years, and he was set in front of that temple, and that was a close-knit community. Everybody knew him. They knew he was crippled since he was a little boy. He'd been there 40 years. He even survived Jesus' ministry. And this is one of the things that you need to understand. Timing's important in some of these things. So Jesus never ministered to this guy. He left it for Peter and John, who would come later. When the miracle happened and he came into the temple leaping and shouting and praising God, Peter got up and took the advantage of that to preach, and 3,000 people were saved. Now, I want to say this to you. Miracles, signs, wonders, healings, that type of thing, are doorbells 
The miraculous is a doorbell to salvation. Let me tell you something about what I've experienced in ministry over the years. <clears throat> in our ministry, we have healings and deliverances and signs and wonders. As an example, when we have meetings, people fall under the power. The power of God comes, the glory comes, boom, people fall under the power. They get healed, delivered, things happen. There's sinners that come into those meetings. I might be talking about, I don't know, I could be preaching on anything other than salvation. It doesn't matter. When people see the anointing and power of God in operation and they experience the touch of God, at the end of the service, when I give an altar call, let me tell you, people come and they get saved. The hardest cases, I've had Satanists, I've had a lot of homosexuals. We're talking about people with some of the hardest cases that you can possibly think of that have given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And here, so it is here. This is a difficult case, but when the man was healed, these people literally saw that it did something to them. That's why we need the miraculous. That's why we need the powerful. That's why we need signs and wonders. People ask, why is that so important? A lot of that stuff I don't even understand. It scares me. I don't want anything to do. I don't know if it's God. <clears throat> How do you know it's God? <clears throat> well, point to Jesus. Years ago, when people were falling out in power under the power in, in uh, the uh, uh, Wesley brothers, or was it, I, I can't remember, it was either Wesley or, or uh, who was the guy that preached with the wild eyes, uh, Charles Finney. Uh, somebody went out under the power, they, they fell into a trance down there on the ground, just fell out. And uh, somebody said they'd never seen that before. It freaked out the crowd. And they said, what is that? Is that God? Is it the devil? And he was beginning his ministry there. And he said, well, I don't know. But when, we, when he comes out of it, we'll find out who they give glory to. <laughs> That's common sense. And when he come out and give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we know that it was of God. Certainly the devil's not over there. He's, the devil's going to not give any glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So you need to understand that. So anyway... Signs and wonders point to the powerful God who does the signs and wonders and to his people because the people need to know who to go to to get the help they need and the apostles at the time certainly were those people. Can you all say amen to that? Okay. Now go to Acts chapter 4. We see another scripture here in verse 33. And this is interesting, always been interesting to me. Um... In verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witnesses of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as had possessions of land and houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostle surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, the Levi in the county of Cyrebus, uh, having land sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And then we see in, in, in Acts chapter 5, but a certain, verse 1, a certain man named Ananias with his wife, surprise, his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to this. And they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why is Satan... Fill thy heart, here's a Christian, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While as it remained, was it not my own, and, and after it was sold, was it not my own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart, that was not lied to men, but to God? And, and Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, gave up the ghost, and great reverence came upon all them and heard these things. So they had a, they had a, not a resurrection in church, they had a dropping dead in church because the power of God was so strong and God punctuated what was going on when this deceit came in here. He dealt with it swiftly and to the point. Interesting, isn't it? That's part of the apostles' ministry. That's part of the signs and wonders of the apostle, these type of judgments. You can go through the scriptures and you'll see that. I want to talk about that right now. Uh, Ananias died. Great fear came upon him. His wife came in later. The same thing happened to her. But the result of this was amazing. If you look down at verse 12, <clears throat> and by the hands, after this happened, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And, and the rest just joined the man to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. 
There came also multitudes out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folk, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Now, let me tell you something. That's church. That's powerful. And then an apostle like Peter, who was one of the foundational apostles, had such a grace on him that even this halo of God's power, okay, it wasn't his shadow, it was that anointing, was so influential, so powerful, and so strong at that time, he even got near it, you got healed. You got near it, you had demons that came out. We need that kind of power in the church today, don't we? And people were that sick, they came from all over the place and got healed. Can you imagine how quickly the church grew with that kind of manifestation and that kind of power? Now, you have to understand that that's clearly part of the apostles' ministry. We can see this. That's a very, very powerful and awesome miracle. That's a what I would call special miracle or a special grace for sure. Look at another Acts, in, in, in Acts chapter 19, we'll see another thing here I wanted to point out to you, and, and uh, you can see that there were special miracles, special miracles done by the Apostle Paul. In first night, uh, chapter 19, verse 11, because this place was full of the occult, we had all these false exorcists and everything going around like they do today, and you know, doing all this weird stuff to cast devils out of people and stuff, and... Uh, you know, Paul was raising up a church here. And so in verse 11, it says this, and, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, what were the special miracles? So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons. See, apparently cloth can absorb that anointing. It's a real tangible thing. See, special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. Now, this is not going to be every preacher. These are special miracles. This is a special working of miracles that happened. People were healed. Demons came out of them. All right? And we see this. And then we see a false uh, exorcist, uh, exorcist coming up and using the name of Jesus. And we see the difference. Even Paul clothes could get you healed. So this is a powerful, awesome demonstration of some of the demonstrations of the of the wonderful apostles' ministry. They're all the way through the book of Acts. I don't have time to read them all today. But i got to tell you that any true apostle will have these things. All right? And they'll be different in different apostles' ministries. Some will be more than others. Some will have a stronger healing ministry. Then some will have a stronger deliverance ministry. Some will have, you know, people falling under the power all over. Some maybe won't. I know uh, Oral Roberts laid hands on millions of people. I've never seen uh, anybody fall under the power in his ministry. People got healed. That's, you know, that was, it doesn't matter. It's just all good, you know, if God's doing it. And we need to receive it and understand it. And it doesn't mean that if you're not an apostle, you can't have signs and wonders. Certainly, Philip did as an evangelist. Prophets do. T uh, pastors and teachers. They all have signs that follow their particular ministry. The teaching ministry, for sure, that's revelation. That's a sign, uh, the, the imparting of revelation knowledge. Anyway, we won't get into all that right now. But there's far, far, far more in the Word of God when dealing with the area of signs and wonders concerning apostles than any other ministry gift. Now, I understand that some of it was to get the church established. But isn't that uh, put there to show us today how important it is to really grasp and understand what the apostles' ministry is? Can we use apostles being raised up that have these kind of miraculous events taking place? Now, let me share a little bit out of my ministry because we're going to talk in, uh, in one of these sessions about the sign of the Apostle has about the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. The, in every uh, true Apostle's ministry, they'll get people filled with the Holy Ghost by the multitudes. That's part of that mantle and ministry. You just have to have that, to have that, um, that ministry. It comes with the territory. Believe me when I say that. Now, let me share something that happened in my life. Like I said, there will be a long chain of, <clears throat> excuse me, a long stream of the miraculous events in any true apostle's ministry. When I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I got up off the ground talking in tongues. I talked in tongues for two hours. The Bible says you're edified, and you don't even know, you don't know what that means. Sometimes we don't feel edified. I didn't feel anything. But the Lord, immediately I knew I should go over and get my friend filled with the Holy Ghost. So I drove over, talked to him. When I put, he said he wanted it. 
I just led him to the Lord a few days before that. When I reached out with my hand to touch him, power God hit him and knocked him flat. First time I ever saw that. On the way down, he started talking in tongues and tears were rolling down his eyes as he was baptized in the Holy Ghost and spoke with tongues. That's a miraculous sign and a wonder. And that began in my life at that point. Now, that was tremendous. A few weeks later, we were the same person. We were walking in the, in the park on Saturday and we were talking, uh, two young kids. And uh, I ended up, he said he was blind in his eyes. So I ended up praying for his eyes. And the power of God hit him, fell under the power right in the park on Saturday with people watching. And God gave him 20-20 vision. He's, he, his eyes were illegally blind. And thus started a long string of events. It wasn't long after that that uh, God brought somebody into my life that needed deliverance from demons. First one I ever had. And uh, we ministered to that person and they were delivered from demons. So these signs and wonders begin to follow us. And I can give you examples in our life from that point on of a long string of miraculous signs, wonders, healings, miracles to this day that are taking place in our ministry. This is not to brag. It had nothing to do with bragging. If anybody knows the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if anybody wants to give God the glory more than me, I don't know. Because I know what, you know, I, I fall short in so many areas, really. It's amazing that God can use any of us, isn't it? But he does. And because of the calling on my life, and because of the anointing on my life, signs, wonders, and miracles, and divers gifts of the Holy Ghost follow us. And they have for years. Now, let me say this to you. With signs, wonders, miracles, and diverse healing uh, gifts comes persecution. And you're going to have to get used to that. Apostle Paul got persecuted. I'm sure everybody does. And that comes with the territory. A lot of people don't uh, understand it, like it even in the church today. But don't let that discourage you. Okay. So that's a good session. Amen. Um I want to say this, you can go over to our website, faithalivefellowship.org. That's faithalivefellowship.org. That's, the website is being um, redone. On there, there's, there's seminars. We're going to put more on there later. But there's seminars on there. There's, there, there's a lot of teaching. It's all free. We have books you can buy. But uh, I want you to get you over there and check it out. If, you, if you'd like to have us come preach in your conference your seminar, you know, your church or whatever. Uh, just feel free. You can go right over there and you can put that. You can write us an email, go over to a, our our uh, people that help me with that and we can make time for you. And we'd love to do it. If you'd like to leave an offering. You know, many of you watch me on a consistent basis. In fact, thousands of people now. And, you know, we need about a thousand of you to just, you know, pray about this. Just just give us an opportunity, just, just any amount Pray about a, uh, to partner with us on a monthly basis. You can do it right there at faithalifefellowship.org or you can find the address of the church. It's post office box 605 Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, 54235. And send us any amount. If we had a 1,000 people and average $20 uh, for every gift a month, average, okay, we could really, really have an impact on this world. We could reach literally millions of people. That's all it takes. I know how to do it. We are reaching many, but we just, it takes money to do this stuff. And I, and that's just the way it is. So could you consider that? Please help us. If our, if our teachings have been a blessing to you, please think about that. Think about the seed we planted in you. Plant some seed in us. That's the that's the, the, the biblical way of doing things. Until next time, we love you. Remember this. Feed your faith and starve your doubts to death. God bless you. We love you. And we're praying for you.